Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, we see here, um, it's a great pas uh, passage with the Apostle Paul explaining how, um, you know, he's, he's preaching the gospel of Christ and how he could take a reward, but he doesn't. He doesn't want anyone to make his glory in void. And um, we're going to focus in, though, mostly at the end of the chapter here where he says that um, he talks about running a race. And he's, he's likening his life and his ministry to running a race. And he's saying that, you know, when, when you run a race, it says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And that word temperate, I preached a sermon on temperance recently, and this is going to be similar to temperance, but it's not quite exactly the same. Um, they're temperate in all things, meaning that they're able to control themselves in all things. And let's just think for a second on this, on this concept of running a race. Because what I'm preaching about tonight is having discipline in your life. And we're going to go into also at the end of the sermon, discipline, like as in disciplining your children. But we're going to talk, we're going to start off with discipline, just, just having your own self-discipline and being able to control yourself which isn't exactly the same as being temperate, although temperate, be, having temperance is tied in with discipline. Um, there's a lot of things tied in together. But um, the Apostle Paul, he's, he's likening his work, his preaching the gospel as to those that run a race. And basically those that run a race, they prepare for it, they work for it. And it says that they, um, they striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he's saying he keeps under his body. It means he keeps his body in control. He is the one in charge. He is in control. And he brings his body into subjection, meaning that he's going to dictate what he does with his body. He's not going to just let his you know, sinful lusts of the flesh take over and just submit himself unto that. He's going to put his body in subjection and submit his body unto himself. And this is a great example of someone who has good discipline over themselves, over their lives, over their actions, over their bodies. It's, it's a well-disciplined thing to be able to say that, I keep my body in, in subjection, in control. I'm the boss. I don't just do whatever feels good. I don't just do something that, that just pops into my head or some urge or impulse that I have. And this is what we need to learn. So he likens it to running a race. Now, I noticed for myself, um, there's a lot of sports. You know, there's team sports and there's individual sports. And um, I was a swimmer. And, and one of the things with swimming it's a very, very individualized sport. And when you compete, when you're in the water, you can't even really see a whole lot of what's going on around you. And one of the things that I took away from all my years competitively swimming was the fact that I was, I was able to build some mental strength and mental toughness. And you can do this in lots of different sports. And I think this is one of the good values of getting into sports and, and participating in a sport is the, the, the strength, the mental strength that you can build for yourself and the discipline that you learn. Now, in order to win the main event in whatever sport you're in, in swimming, you know, at the, at the end of the year, the season, when you go to state and you do these other things, um, these, these main competitions, obviously you can't win unless you've been practicing and training and putting in all that hard work way before that event comes up. You need to make sure you're, you're getting yourself to practice. You're going every single day. Some people, sometimes we'd have practice twice a day. You go in the morning and you go in the evening and you're dedicated and you have to stay consistent with it. But if you don't have self-discipline, it's easy to, to have your alarm go off in the morning and just turn around and go back to sleep because it's early. Because your body is telling you, I don't want to go do this. I'm tired. Let's just go back to sleep. Or then later, you know, if you're going to practice again, oh, it's been a long day. I just want to go home. I don't want to do this. And having the character and, and 
making yourself go and do these things, you're, you're, you're disciplining yourself and you're, you're forming the habits that you need to do in order to continue to do something you want to do. So um, I'm going to get into that here in just a minute. I'll, I'll do a brief overview of what we're going to get into because if you want to be disciplined, it's going to start in your mind or in your heart with wanting to do something. That's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to say, you know what? I have a goal. I have an objective. I want to do this, thus, and so. If it's a sport, we want to win this competition. This is the objective. This is the main goal. So you have to have that in your mind. Otherwise, there's nothing to get started on. Then you have to set up a schedule or a plan. You need to be able to, to, to lay out going forward, well, how are we going to accomplish this goal? We have to lay out how often are you going to train, practice, whatever it is that you need to do to get to that goal. From there, you're gonna, you have to just stay consistent and follow that plan. Don't let yourself get deterred. Don't get distracted. You have to stay on course. And then, of course, you need to stay focused on the goal so that you can, you can continue on the plan that you've set forth. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the, on the main goal to keep you motivated to continue to be disciplined. You follow this, these, these types of techniques and you will, it will help you to discipline yourself to be able to accomplish great things. Now, there's lots of good things that you can set forward to do to accomplish. And like I said, I was giving you the example of myself with swimming. You know, when, when you get in that water, you have to push yourself. There's no one else pushing you. There's no one else necessarily relying on you as far as teammates go. Um, you earn points for the overall score, but that's not the same thing. It's, it's, it's very highly individualized and you're racing against other people. And you need to have the strength and the toughness, first of all, in your mind to be able to push yourself to keep going. Because with physical exertion, whether it be swimming or again, anything else, you start to get tired, you start to get weary, you start to have problems, maybe you cramp up, maybe you know, you're know you having a hard time breathing, but you need to be able to, to keep going and have that mental toughness and mental discipline to push yourself to go that extra mile, to go, to go the extra yards and, and do whatever it is that you need to do. So um, we're gonna look at a lot of scripture tonight. We started off in 1 Corinthians chapter nine where Paul says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest by any means when I preach to others, my, I myself should be a castaway. Keeping control of yourself. And this is important. This, is, this will affect all areas of your life. Not even just your spiritual areas. This, this is something that can help you in your daily life. So listen up and try to get what is being taught this morning from the Bible and try to, as we go through this, remember it so you can make the application in your life so that you can make yourself disciplined enough to achieve goals and to accomplish goals and to get a lot of good, like a lot of things done in whatever area that may be. The Bible, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Luke 14. In 1 Chronicles 12, 33, the Bible says, Of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle expert in war with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank, they were not of double heart. One of the important things about, about being disciplined and what this is, this example that the Bible says here when it's talking about the men of Zebulun, the, the, the warriors, they were well disciplined because they were not of double heart. They were able to keep rank. You think about an army and you're on the battlefield and your enemy's coming at you, your enemy's attacking you and maybe they look like they have a much stronger force than the one that you have. Well, if an army is full of men that are of double heart, their whole heart isn't in it, they're only kind of halfway into what they're doing, those men are going to turn around and run away in the face of, of you know, uh, um, this type of danger or in the face of, of being outmanned or, or some kind of threat like that. They're going to turn around and run because their heart's not in it. And that's why these men of Zebulun, says they were not of double heart, they were able to keep rank. So even when the enemies come, they don't back down. They don't waver. They stand strong. They keep their formation strong because they know that that is the only way, the only chance that they're going to have to survive is to keep themselves 
according to plan, keep themselves in that formation. That is their best defense. As soon as they break ranks, it's all over. They're going to get slaughtered. But they need to have that discipline, that mental discipline and toughness to be able to say, we're not going to move an inch. And they have to know in advance, well, this is the goal. They have to know this is the best way to do it. We have to be all in it. Our heart has to be ready to do this. We can't get scared. We can't turn around and run away. And whatever you set yourself to do, the Bible says, do all things heartily as unto the Lord. If you set your mind to do something, don't just do it halfway. Don't just think, hey, this would be a good idea, but don't get all of your heart into it. And, you know, it could go in so many directions. You could use that. You got, a, you got a project at home. You got something you want to do for the Lord, whether it be, it could be Bible reading, it could be prayer, it can be, you know, teaching the kids. It could be um, getting some major project done. Whatever it is that you decide to do with your time and your energy and your efforts, don't get in it halfway. Do it all the way. Come up with a plan. Set a goal. And make sure you're disciplined to be able to follow through with you and execute your plan and to get it done so that's not just half-hearted and then as soon as something gets difficult, you just turn around and do something else. Um, so the first point is to start... On deciding on doing something, setting a goal. Psalm 17, 3 says this, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. So in here we see from the Bible the, the goal, the, the purpose, setting that in your heart to say, I am purposed that my mouth will not transgress, shall not transgress. Meaning, I'm going to be careful and pay attention to things that I say, the things that come out of my mouth. I'm going to put a filter on that. When I think a thought, I'm going to wait. I'm going to pause before I open up my mouth and say something because I don't want my mouth to transgress. So in this case, this would be the goal. And, we're, and then you would follow along with the steps. Well, how am I going to make sure that my mouth doesn't transgress? Well, you'd have to know what a transgression of the mouth is. So one of the things you'd probably have to do is make sure that you're, you read the Bible and you're studying and looking for, hey, what types of things do I, it, that I can say are going to be a transgression against God? And then you set up your plan and you execute it and you stick with it. And you don't, um, you don't stop halfway through and say, oh man, this is just way too hard. I'm just going to give up. You stick with it and finish it through to the end. And, and you can only do that through proper discipline. So you're in Luke 14. We're going to look at the second point of, of setting a schedule or a plan. We're going to see some, some biblical application of this. Luke 14, look at verse 26. The Bible says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and, his, and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And this is tied into two of the points, actually. One of them is not being of a double heart. You need to have your whole heart in, in it, and you need to count the cost ahead of time. This is the value of, of setting a schedule or a plan, making sure you know what you're getting yourself into. You have the objective, but before you even get started, what am I going to have to do to accomplish this? And that's what Jesus is teaching them here, saying, look, if you're going to build a great building, the first thing, you, you don't just go out and start buying materials and start pouring, laying a foundation and just start going at it. You need to have a plan. You need to say, well, how much money is this going to cost? What am I going to have to do? Do I have enough resources? Do I have the space to do this? Well, I want it to be this tall. So in order to be structurally sound, how big does the base have to be? And, and on and on and on. And you, and you figure out the plan first. Before you ever get started into the work, you have to make the plan. Because if you don't do that, 
you're not gonna be able to finish it. And, and, and you're gonna you start doing, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna fail, you're gonna falter and get discouraged. And you wanna be successful, obviously, whatever it is that you have set in your mind to do, you want that accomplished. And you have to go in with a whole heart, like Jesus was saying, you can't be his disciples if you are gonna love your physical family more than him. You have to be willing to give everything to Jesus in order to be his disciple. Now, obviously, it's not talking about being saved. That's talking about following him and doing his work and doing his will, and doing the things that he wants you to do. You have to be committed unto him. First of all, you have to have your whole heart in it. And when you make a decision to be a disciple of Christ, you should know ahead of time, this is going to be difficult. This is not easy. And unfortunately, not enough pastors and people who start churches think about this hard enough because what happens is, They'll get started and realize, wow, this really is a lot of work. There is a lot of times here when, you know, you could get discouraged when people don't show up to church, when there's no one here and you just feel empty and you feel like nothing is working. You have to know in advance that you are in it. Your heart is in it and that you are not going to back down. You're going to continue to be a disciple of Christ. You are going to do what God has set forward for you to do because your whole heart is in it and you're willing to give anything for him to do that so that you don't begin to start a work and then fail because you quit, because you, you, you weren't prepared, because it's just too much for you to handle. And my friends, nothing in this world will be too much for you to handle if you're doing God's will. God has a way out for it, but we also need to be wise about it and, and learn in advance what is it all gonna take? What is it gonna require of us to do this work? And um, with anything that you set your heart to do, anything you set your mind to do, you need to make sure that you have that plan. Now, Bible reading is a good example of needing a, a good plan to do so. If you have a goal, say for example, a lot of people have a goal where they want to be able to read their Bible from cover to cover in a year, which is a great goal and it's a great desire. But you need to make sure you set forth with that plan because what some people like to do is say, well, I want to read the Bible and know the whole Bible and um, I want to get it done in a year, but they don't really have a good plan for that. So they sometimes when they feel like it, maybe the first day they get real excited and they'll read a whole bunch of, of Bible and you know maybe they'll start at the beginning or maybe they'll just say, well, I just want to pick it up and read you know, different portions every day. But they don't really have a plan. And without a plan, if you just pick it up and read different portions, you might not know which portions you've read before if you're not keeping track of that. You need to at least understand in advance, say, hey, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, I need a, a method of making sure I don't duplicate what I've read so I truly do leave no chapter uncovered and unread that I do hit everything. Or maybe some people start from the beginning and they'll get excited and start reading a bunch. But then they get to some long chapters that, are, that might be a little bit hard to get through, especially your first time through reading the Bible. And you might think it's kind of boring. And they'll, get, they'll read one chapter and think, okay, well, that's enough. I, I can't really read anymore. This is too dry for me. I can't do anymore. And they'll find out that the more you do that, they'll either stop reading completely or they just won't be on track to finish within their allotted time and uh, that they set, the, set out to do. So one good thing to do if you, if you do have a goal of reading the Bible so many times in a year is figure out, okay, well, I can either read this fast, so I need to devote this much time of, di of Bible reading a day, or look at the chapters and figure out, you know, there's this many chapters in the Bible, and I want to read the Bible this many times a year, so I need to read X amount of, of chapters a day in order to accomplish that goal or a week and you have to be able to stick with it. But that's that would be the type of plan that you need. Um, the Bible says in Isaiah 28 verse 9, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Our understanding of the Bible is something that's going to come slowly. Maybe you have a goal of understanding a particular doctrine or say, I want to know, you know, all about the end times. That's a good goal to have, but the information is going to come little, little by little. You need to be able to build upon that and build upon that. It's going to take some time. You need to know this in advance that learning the doctrine, learning the Bible is going to, it's not going to happen overnight. 
So you can't just study the Bible for one evening on a subject and just think, well, I just know everything about this subject now. Because you won't. You need to go back to it. You need to set out a plan and say, okay, I'm going to read the book of Revelation this many times. I'm going to read the book of Daniel. I'm going to read Jeremiah. I'm going to read Ezekiel. I'm going to read Joel. I'm going to read Obadiah. I'm going to read all these different places. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. I'm going to read these places that have end times events in it. And there's a lot of places in the Bible that do that. So the, a study like that, you probably don't want to get into too much until you know a little bit of the Bible overall in general anyways to be able to know what to study to begin with. But um, that's kind of going off on a tangent. Let's go here on the next point. So we need to, first of all, make sure your heart is in it. You, you decide, you have a goal, I want to do this, I want to accomplish this, but I want to be disciplined about it. I want to make sure that I accomplish my goal. I want to make sure that I'm going to see this through to the end. So you have a desire, you have a goal, you have a want. Make sure your whole heart is in it. Make sure you set up a good plan. Once you have your plan in place, say, okay, this is good. You need to stay consistent. Don't let circumstances deter you from continuing on with your goal because things are going to pop up. You know, anyone, anytime you make a schedule, you, you, you said, say, okay, I'm going to do this this many times a day. Invariably, something's going to come up and it's going to mess up your schedule. Now, you have to be able to understand that again in advance and say, okay, what am I going to do when this happens? I need to be able to bounce back. I need to not stop. Just because you get derailed or detract for, for a week or a day or however long it may be, you have to be able to set yourself back. And again, that requires discipline. That requires strength in your mind to be able to, to go back and to do that and to not get distracted with other things. And this is probably the hardest part of being disciplined. And this is like the whole essence of being disciplined is, is being able to do that, to stick with the plan, to not get sidetracked and to be able to continue once if you do get sidetracked for a short amount of time. And this really revolves around remaining diligent to do what you set out to do. Diligent, we're going to look at some verses for in the Bible that, that talk about being diligent. Um, Again, if your whole heart's in it, it's easier to be diligent about doing things because you still want to do it. Joshua 22.5 says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So we see here in the diligent heed to obeying God's law, he says to keep his commandments, to cleave to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. One of the keys to making sure you remain diligent in doing and continuing to do it is, is to make sure your heart is still in what you're doing. Make sure that, that you, you have that goal in mind and you don't lose sight of it. Proverbs 10, 4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Bible says in Proverbs 22, 29, Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. Both of these verses we can look at and see if you are diligent in doing the work, if you're not going to let yourself get lazy, get slothful, let the flesh just creep up and, and persuade you not to keep working, if you can stay diligent and keep working and stick with your plan, it will work out for you. That's why the hand of the diligent maketh rich. And that's why the, the, the man who's diligent in his business is going to stand before kings. He's going to be well respected. He's going to get somewhere in his business as opposed to, to just standing before mean men and having people rule over you. Now, one thing that requires a great deal of discipline and, and one aspect of your Christian life to apply this sermon to is prayer. And this is something, I'll be honest with you, that I struggle with personally. This is one of the hardest areas of my Christian life to maintain a proper discipline and to continue to pray in a regular basis, in a regular manner. And Because um, you need discipline in making the time and sticking to it. And also be disciplined in praying for extended periods of time. If you turn to Matthew chapter 26, 
Because we're going to see here a, a discipline that we need to have to be able to pray. You know, it's not enough. I don't believe it's enough just to pray for five minutes a day or ten minutes a day. I think there's going to be times where we're going to need to get in serious prayer time with God and, and get in communication with Him and spend a good hour or two hours and just, and just pour your heart out to God and work that into your schedule. Now, as we saw last week in the book of John, we have good motivation for praying to God. Jesus Christ tells us that if we pray anything in His name, He'll do it. That is great motivation and something we need to keep in our minds over and over again in the subject of prayer to make sure that we can stay disciplined and continue to pray. That should help keep your heart in wanting to pray, is that keeping that reminder. So a good thing to do would be to memorize verses like that. So when, when it gets hard, when your flesh creeps in and tries to get you to not pray because you're tired, you got all these other things going on, keep that in mind as motivation to say, no, I'm going to stay disciplined in this area. I am going to keep doing this. I'm going to stick to my schedule. My schedule is this, and I'm going to keep doing it. Um, even just out today, man, it was, it was tough out there going soul winning. And you know, I set apart Sundays in between the service to, to really put in a lot of hours and to try to get the most amount of time chunk together in, in going out and knocking on doors. And my flesh was fighting me today. It was, it was, it was tough going. No one really seemed to want to listen. Nobody ended up getting saved. My legs were getting tired. My mouth was getting dry. And, you know, I'm not complaining at all. Just this, this is a, physically what I was experiencing and what I was going through. And in my mind, you keep on, your mind wants it, your, well, it's your flesh, really. Your flesh wants to keep on coming up with excuses and say, well, you've done enough. Just, just, just call it quit. It's not a good day anyways. Just go home. Go do something else. But you need to have that mental toughness, that mental discipline to say, you know what? No, this is what I set out to do. I knew how much I wanted to do before I went out soul winning today. I had my objective. And obviously you hope to never meet that because your objective really is to win souls. But if you're not winning souls like I was doing, you at least have, I had a section on my map. I'm going to do all this street, both sides. I'm going to do all, all this work. And I've got it all laid out that, that if nothing's going to, if nothing else, I'll at least get all of this done. And you have to have that discipline to be able to say no because I have a bigger goal than just my feet are tired or I'm sleepy. You need to have that bigger goal and want to accomplish and have your heart in it. Even when things are happening to get you discouraged, we need to maintain a discipline and, and maintain that discipline is how you're going to truly get the, the great works done for God. You're in Matthew 26. Look at verse number 38. We're going to see here when Jesus is in the Garden of Geth Gethsemane and he speaks unto his disciples. When Jesus was going to pray, he says in verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. All the more reason why we need to have that discipline and that control, like Paul said, to bring our bodies into subjection. You are going to get weary. You're going to get tired. When you set forth to do a great work, when you set forth to work for God, no matter what that may be, studying the Bible, praying, soul winning, um, you know, preaching, all these things that you have to do, you will have physical obstacles to that and physical weariness, as Peter did. But, but Jesus was rebuking and said, Look, can't you just stay up for one hour? Look, I know you're willing in your spirit, but your flesh is weak. But I'm asking you to stay up with me to watch and to pray. And we need to make sure that we can keep ourselves disciplined so that we don't fall asleep. Maybe, maybe you set your prayer time and you schedule it for the evening and you're real tired in the evening. Well, one of the things I would suggest is don't pray in your bed. If you're really tired and you have a goal and say, well, I'm going to pray. I've got all these people to pray for. I've got a list. 
or um, I just want to make sure no matter what that I can spend at least 20 minutes praying with God. Whatever it may be, whatever your personal plan is and your goal is, don't make it easy on your flesh to fail you so that you do fall asleep. If you're going to spend prayer time, make sure you do it maybe on your knees next to your bed or um, you know, somewhere else sitting at a table or, or standing up, well, whatever it may be, to make sure that you get your prayer time done, that you don't fail yourself and allow yourself to fall asleep. <clears throat> we need to stay focused on the goal. That's going to help us to maintain where we're going. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. What's going to keep us going and keep us according to plan and keep us disciplined is that focus on the goal. This is one of the most important points to recognize and to realize when, when you're accomplishing something, when you set forth a plan, is to make sure that you stay focused on the end, on the goal, on the prize. In our Christian life, we need to make sure that we stay focused, that that God's going to lay up treasures for us in heaven. The work that we're doing here is not in vain. Now, you may not be able to see it. You need to have the faith to know that it's true, to know that it's there. You trust in the Bible. You trust God's word. You may be going through hard trials. You may be going through all kinds of problems. But know, just knowing that you are laying rewards for yourself up in heaven, you're laying up an inheritance for yourself that were moth and rust doth not corrupt, and thieves do not break forth and steal. That is there, and it's assured. That is some, some encouragement and exhortation that you can get from God's Word to keep on the path, to keep going strong, to keep moving forward. That's one of the things that helps me in, in, in starting this church. I know that I'm doing what God has set forth for me to do. I don't need to see... The results in the short term to, to be convinced that I'm doing the right thing. And I'm going to continue doing it no matter what. I'm going to keep doing the work that God has set for because I know the end goal and I know the, the job that has been given to me to do. And I'm going to continue to do this. But James 1, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let, him not, let, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with, with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Flip over to James chapter 5. Again, your heart needs to be in it. You can't have a double heart. You can't be double-minded and be thinking, well, this is what I'm going to do, and if this doesn't work out, I'm going to back out. No, if you're going to set forward to do something, just do it. Don't leave yourself an exit plan. Don't leave yourself with, a, with an option to fail. Go in it to win it. Go in it to accomplish what it is you're setting out to accomplish. Don't be unstable in all your ways. Don't be double-minded on things. James chapter 5, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Faith is required for you to endure whatever it is you're going through with patience, to endure the, the troubles that come along as you try to accomplish your goals that you're setting out to do, trying to stick to your plan, you need to have that faith of seeing the end in advance in order to endure and to patiently endure. What does it mean to patiently endure? Well, things happen and you don't get yourself all worked up to the point to where you're ready to quit. You can take it. It's gonna, you're just going to roll with it. You're going to be patient with these problems that come your way. You need to stay focused on things that are unseen in order to maintain your discipline, in order to make sure that what I'm doing is disciplined. I'm going to keep moving forward in this path because I know it's right. I still want to make accomplish that goal. 
I know that goal is there. I can see it. So I'm going to keep moving through the problems that we have. And that's why he brings up here in James 5 the patience of Job. Job knew what he was to do with his life. He was to be an upright man, and he was. He lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He, he got, became sick. He lost all kinds of things, yet he had the patience to not curse God, to not speak against God, to not sin foolishly with his lips because he still saw the end of the Lord. He knew that he was saved. He knew that things were going to be okay in the end because he still maintained his faith in the Lord. And that's what he says. You have seen the, the, the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He knew who God was. He didn't understand what was going on in his life. He didn't know why the things were happening to him that were happening to him. He didn't get it. But he never lost his faith in God and he knew who God was. So he maintained and held his integrity and kept moving forward. Job is an excellent exa example of a Christian that we can look to that goes through hard times yet maintains integrity because he has discipline. Job was the one that made a covenant with his eyes. He said, so why then should he look upon a maid? He had discipline in all areas of his life. He was able to say, you know what? I know that as a man, my flesh has a desire to lust after women, and I'm going to control that because I'm going to bring my body in subjection. I'm not going to allow my body to lust after other women. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a covenant. This is my plan. I, my heart, I don't want to sin against God. I don't want to have this wickedness in my, in my thoughts. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes. And when my eyes see something, they're going to turn away and I'm not going to look back at that a second time. I'm going to make sure that I can keep my mind and my heart pure and not think about other women because I'm going to make sure that my eyes is not, are not looking on them. That was his plan. It was a good plan. And in order to execute that plan, you need to be well disciplined. You need to be able to follow through. You need to be able to maintain the faith. You need to understand the goal and your heart needs to be in it. You can't let your, your, your heart get, get torn into two and into, 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 well, I like this flesh feeling a lot, but I don't really want to do that. You, you need to get your heart all into walking in the spirit and walking in the new man. Turn, if you want, to Hebrews chapter 12. just one page back from or two pages back from James 5 where you were Hebrews 12 look at verse number one the Bible says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So again, we're being admonished here about running a race with patience. We're referred to again, don't lose sight of the goal. That's why he says looking unto Jesus. So we have this race set out before us, the race of the Christian life, the race that we want to run lawfully. We want to do it the right way. We want to win the way that God has set out for us to do. We don't want to fail. We don't want to lose this race. We don't want to get out of the race and quit. We want to keep going. How are we going to maintain this race? Well, the goal is looking towards the finish line, looking towards the end, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And he tells us we need to look to Jesus because Jesus went through hard times. Jesus had to endure hardship. He had the discipline to endure the hardship that he went through when he went to the cross. Because I'll tell you what, the Bible tells us right here, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't a nice thing that Jesus went through. He went to the cross. He had to, 
He had to endure the cross. He suffered it to happen. He despised the shame. The Son of God being spit on, beaten up, ridiculed, mocked, all the things that happened to him, that's shameful. To have our sins in his own body on the tree, that was shameful for Jesus Christ to have that. That was not pleasant for him, yet he endured it. Why did he endure it? Because he knew the end. His eyes, his heart was focused on the end result, not on the current circumstances. He did not allow that to, to, to get him off, off track and off focus from what he's doing. It says in verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We need to consider Jesus so that we don't get wearied. When we, when we have problems coming up, think about what he went through. And Jesus tells us, and this is the verse I was actually looking for in verse 2, the reason why Jesus went through everything, it was for the joy that was set before him. That's why he endured the cross. That's why he, he went through everything, was for that joy. He knew what was going to come. He knew what he was doing, who he was doing it for, and he knew the joy that he was going to have being seated on the right hand of God the Father. And he knew this in advance, so it makes it easier going through because he had his mind on the goal. And this was unfortunately one of the steps in the path that he had to take in order to attain his goal. And sometimes our goals come with much difficulty, and we need to get through that, but we, if we keep our minds focused and we have faith, we can get through that. We're in Hebrews 12. Let's keep reading here. Now in verse number 5, it says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now we're going to start getting into the discipline that we need to, to use with our children. Because as adults, we need to discipline ourselves. And when you become an adult, you don't need discipline anymore of being chastened like um, physically with a beating, right? Um, some people, I think, still do. But you should be, when you become an adult, you shouldn't act like a child. You should be able to, to discipline yourself without having, having any need for a physical consequence for your actions. You ought to be able to get your mind and get your body under subjection and under control with that discipline. Because when we discipline children, that is what we're doing. We're teaching them to be controlled, to be in control of themselves, so that when you tell a child to sit down, they have the discipline to be able to sit down in their chair. Now, with children, what we have to do oftentimes is to give them a beating, to give them a spanking. That is what's required to get them to understand, hey, you need to obey, you need to do this, this is the way that you're going to live, so that they need that type of help along the way in order to achieve their proper discipline of being able to be in control of themselves and to behave themselves appropriately. So the Bible says in verse 6, it says, For the whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you're a son of God, you're going to get chastened. You're going to get scourged because God loves you. God is a loving father and he will discipline you. He will scourge you and chasten you. He says, For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all, all are partakers, then ye are, are ye bastards and not sons. He's saying, if you don't get discipline from God, you're, just a, you're a bastard. Think about that. And think about yourself with your children. Do you discipline your, son, your children? Do you scourge them? Do you chasten them? Because God would never think of not chastening His children. And if you're not doing it, you know, do you think you're better than God or, or do you think God's ways are appropriate? Let's keep reading here, verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? 
For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So the goal of the disciplining, the Bible tells us, is to, um, he says that it's for our profit. It's for our own good. And so that we could become better people, so that we could improve our walk with God. And that's why he says, no chasing for the present seems to be joyous. It's not pleasant to go through chasing. It's not a pleasant experience. It's a hardship that you have to deal with. But afterward, after that chastening, after that scourging, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, turn if you would to Proverbs. We're going to finish up in Proverbs. Proverbs 22. We're quickly just going to read a few verses regarding training a child. Because in order to be disciplined, discipline requires training. And in order to train, though, training requires discipline. They both, they both kind of need each other. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Children need to be trained. They need to train in order to have that discipline. And it's the same thing. You, you could liken it to a race. In order to run that race and to win that race, you need to train. In order to make sure when you are finally involved in that race that you're not going to back out, you, <coughs> you're not going to quit, you will endure. You need to make sure that you have trained properly, that you've experience the pain you know what the discomfort is like and you can work through that and you have the endurance and the patience to say i've been through this before i can make it through it again children need to be trained up they need to be taught they need to be disciplined yes but they also need to be taught and trained in the way that they should go they need to know the path that they need to take it needs to be laid out for them and explained to them so that way when they do grow up they don't depart from that path. It's not enough just to do the just to do the the physical spankings and beatings under the child. They need to be shown the way. They need to be trained. There's training involved in it. That's not just a paddle to the to the behind. They need to understand and know why it's happening. They need to be explained the right way that they need to walk in, so that they know what's expected of them. And they know um, the way that God would like them to go. <clears throat> Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. So if you're sparing your rod, the Bible says you hate your son. If you're not using the rod to discipline your, your, your son, you hate him. That's the Bible, not me. Proverbs 23, 13 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Strong words. Again, uh, we've covered this in other sermons, but I like to keep going back to them. We need to hear them. They need to be reinforced because we live in a culture today of society that says not to spank your children. It doesn't work. It's ineffective. It's cruel. Whatever it may be, the Bible tells us the opposite. And I don't care what the world says. I don't care what godless study you want to turn to of people who don't believe in God, some atheists. And, and try to tell you that spanking doesn't work because I believe the Bible. I believe God's word. I know that it works. And that's the method that we're going to use and that's the method that God espouses to use. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The last thing we need is a bunch of, mo bunch of monsters running around that grow up into bigger monsters that don't believe in hell because they were never properly disciplined as children. Now my last point, it's just kind of off to a side. You say, I want to get more disciplined in my life. I want to be able to restrain myself more. I want to be more temperate. I want to gain this mental toughness to be able to keep doing and to move forward and, and, to, and to accomplish what I need to accomplish. What I would suggest to you, if you can do this, is fasting. Fasting is a great way for you to help keep your body under subjection. 
You need to make a plan. You need to set out a goal. And if you've never done it before, know in advance it's not going to be easy, but set out a time to where and, and set out a plan so that it will be easier for you so you can accomplish your goal at least the first time. If you want to, you know, experiencing hunger is a, is a pretty powerful experience. It's, it's a powerful fleshly desire to eat food. So if you've never done it before, I suggest doing that because once you accomplish it, you, you start to realize and understand at first, you're like, oh man, I'm so hungry. How am I ever going to make it through this? But at the end, when you accomplish the goal, you can look back, you have that new experience. You've gained that new knowledge and you've gained um, some encouragement because you've set forward to do something and you accomplished that goal. Accomplishing goals is important to continue to create new ones and move forward. So if you have a problem with just your own self-discipline, maybe it's eating foods, maybe it's, you know, what, whatever it may be, whatever, whatever it is in your life that, that you are not very well disciplined with, reading the Bible, um, praying, you know, set for, make a plan for yourself, get your heart into it, and, um, and don't let yourself get sidetracked, stay focused on that goal. And again, one way I think that'll help you, and, and I believe this helps in all areas, not just with food, but if you can fast, say, I'm going to fast for 24 hours. And maybe at first you can say, well, I'm going to drink water. Water's okay. And you set forth your ground rules. Say, this is going to be my fast. I'm going to fast to the Lord. I'm going to pray, but I'm going to do this. And there's so many benefits from fasting. And one of the big ones is learning to control your appetites. Specifically with fasting, you're talking about food. But, I mean, apply this to any sin. Because as all a sin is, you have an appetite to do something that's not right. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with eating. But by doing that, because it's such a strong desire, you are learning how to tell your flesh no. You are learning how, you're, you're, you're learning discipline. You're training yourself to say no. I will not do this. And the more you can, you can do these things, the stronger your discipline will become, the stronger your mind will become to control that. And like I said, I thank God I was in, I was in a type of a sport where I got some of that knowledge and, and some of that experience. Yeah, it was a worldly thing. It's, I mean, there was nothing spiritual about it, but it helped me later in life to accomplish so many other goals to, to make sure that I'm disciplined. And again, I would try spiritually, I would try fasting. And, and once you can set, you decide you're going to do something and not succumb and not give in, it gives you more empowerment over your body. And you can truly say, like Paul did, you know, I put my body in subjection. I'm not going to let it rule over me. And that will help you to achieve all of your goals and to maintain a proper discipline. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this great truth in the Bible. Lord, I have my own personal struggles that I have to deal with, dear God, with getting things done. I pray that you would please help me and help everybody here tonight. Help us to, to set forth goals, to have our hearts into it, dear God, to set out a plan and to follow those plans with, with, uh, with discipline and to um, really be diligent to continue and, and to keep our hearts and minds focused on the end goal and on the end result. Dear Lord, help us not to waver, to be double-hearted, um, but that we can put our heart into it completely and to achieve great things to bring honor and glory unto your name. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.